Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down, and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, and I was malicious, and I don't care. <laughs> Look at him going to town. Listen, I appreciate you joining uh, Knuckles here on the Raw Knuckles podcast. Awesome uh, that you uh, agreed to come on with me. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I read this book, and it's an awesome book, uh, The Crazy Game. And I love the beginning because, man, it tells me a lot about you in, in, in that first few paragraphs. Being a 14-year-old kid in a silo, Getting cornered by a bear. I, 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 I don't know what happened there. Well, I, I just, I had to go shovel out the, the, the bin, the big silo, grain bin, just the old stuff that was left over on the floor. It might get a little moldy, and so they send me out into the, the back forty, and I got, uh, we got a lot of bears up there, and of course they gave me a pickup to drive, which was cool because I'm just a kid, and, and a rifle. And uh, I knew what the rifle was for. I thought I'd never have to use it, but yeah, all of a sudden, the, there's a the, the bin is very uh, the door is very small, and all of a sudden that's my only light, and all of a sudden it's going dark, and I look and there's a bear snoo- snooping around looking for some grain, so I had to I had to shoot him to get out of there, <laughs> and wow. then crawl and then crawl over his warm body. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. Like honestly, when I think I was a kid. You know, I used to have to take the train into downtown Boston for certain things. And I always carried a knife with me, you yeah. know, because the train was dangerous. I always had a knife. And, you know, this is the difference of the way we grew up. You carried a gun, I carried a knife. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> thank God you had that gun with you. But yeah. listen, yeah. Uh, you know, I want to kind of, I know you probably got swarmed yeah. with messages. Uh and the recent accident that happened over in, in England with Adam Johnson and um, uh, the other player involved, Matt uh, Petgrave. Uh, you know, I, I read the article in The Athletic and everybody seeing how Clint's doing, and, and that's awesome. But then afterwards, it's like, leave me alone. It was like overwhelming. What, so that so, incident, so why, are we, why are we doing this podcast then? You didn't leave me alone. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, well, I want to cut to the chase with that because right. I, there's so much more I want to talk to you about. But, you know, that incident, um, you know, when you when did you see it before you started getting all these texts or hear about it or all of a sudden you started getting all these texts? Well, you know, I get all these texts and, of course, the curiosity and I knew better. Don't Clint, don't watch the video. It's going to trigger you, you know, and. But uh, I, I just I had to watch it because I wanted to see, you know, how it happened comparatively to how it happened to me. And, uh, you know, thank God it was a, a, a camera that was quite far away. It wasn't very real, real graphic. Um, yeah, but I was I was super, super curious to find out, you know, and, you know, how we can prevent it possibly if it was preventable, you know. So I had different reasons for looking at it than. And, uh, but I knew better, you know, I probably shouldn't because, uh, it, it was a, it, you know, Knuckles, it was a, a tough couple of days, even, even if it wasn't for the media and the interview requests, uh, just knowing what the, the, the family of Adam's, uh, Adam's family was going through because, you know, my mom was watching the game when I got sliced and, uh, you know, I knew how it affected her. And uh, I heard they were. I heard that they were watching on, you know, live stream. And I just thought, oh, those poor people. Um, you know, I skated off the ice uh, thinking I was going to die, and I did not want my mom to see me, you know, collapse and die uh, on the ice, you know, on TV. So, uh, but I, I certainly, I, you know, Chris, I, 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 pre- I prepared for death. I thought I'm done, and I just got to get off the ice, and uh, you know. It, 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 and that 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 obviously was the onset of uh, uh, years of undiagnosed PTSD, which uh, you know twenty years later I go behind the barn and and I shoot myself, uh, uh, and then I finally got diagnosed and 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 got to heal and and do all the all the therapies and treatments that I you know should have done years ago. 
Yeah, uh, that certainly opened up a lot of things uh, for you in your life. And, um, you know, thank God that you were not successful uh, because you have so much to offer. There's no question about it. And you're a good human being. But it's so good that uh, you were able to address these things. But like you said, that PTSD, um, you know, when I saw your incident and, you know, we had certain interactions you and i before that and one of them was probably me coming down and scoring on you oh yeah <laughs> for sure or punching me in the head <laughs> yeah. we'll go the ladder. punching you ahead we'll go the ladder. Like it. <laughs> but i you know we're both um part of the battle of quebec and it, those games were violent they were vicious uh we did disliked each other i remember seeing you uh you know in in the brawl and all that stuff and you know you have someone I'd be going at it with someone. I just remember those days. And then you went off to, to, to Buffalo and certainly had that happen. I remember when it happened, I was like sick to death watching it because, you know, mm -hmm. even though you and I didn't really have a relationship at that point or know each other, I still, you know, you were part of that, you know, kind of really intense time in our lives yeah. uh, when we were playing against each other. Well, and then that, that when game, I that, saw that, that, I'm like, Chris, that game, I did a podcast for a guy about a year ago and he goes, how does somebody get 17 penalty minutes and ejected out of a game and didn't play one minute of the game? But we brawled, what, <laughs> two, two, three times bench clearing brawls. But yeah, you it's know, crazy. Uh, going it where was you, crazy. Yeah. Uh, but where you're kind of going, I think is, you know, we're all, even though we had that intense rival rivalry with Quebec and Montreal, and we hated even the media fought and the fans, it was it was it was crazy intense. But uh, we're all we're all bonded and brothers through the game. You know, it's amazing how many friends, and I know you can relate to this. The guys that you played with never really met you. You probably might have fought some of them, or at least sticked them, you know, or speared them, or you know, it was, yeah, hockey was hockey back then. You know, that's the way it was. And then you become friends with them uh, down the road, whether it's you're in the game as a coach or a scout or you're like us in recovery. And then you, 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 you meet guys and we're all, we're brothers. It, it's just the way it is. I mean, we're tied by that game, that bond. Yeah, we are. That's for sure. And again, just to, to go back to that, um, when I saw that, I, it sickened me. And it's like, honestly, I, I was there the night here in Montreal when <clears throat> George Paros got in a fight with Colton Orr, Orr pulled his jersey down, and I was up above in the pre press box, and Paros came down and hit his head in the ice, and boy, you could hear it. And it sickened me. Yeah, It sickened yeah. me. I've yeah. seen Proby get knocked out by Todd Ewan, and yeah. his, his legs buckled down. Anyway. It, it sickened me. And here I am, someone who took part in this on a nightly yeah. basis. It was, when I look back, sometimes I, I say, what the hell? But I also understand it. Now, yeah. In seeing that, and that, what happened to you? And the trainer who helped you was a Vietnam veteran, right? And thank yeah. God he was there, right? Well, what was his you know, name? Jim Pizzatelli. I'll never. Pizzatelli. Uh, pizza. You know what? I I tried calling Pizza uh, a couple days ago because I was just going to thank him again uh, for saving my life. And and it's funny, our our careers uh cross many many times over the years like uh we ended up in florida together and in san antonio together and then in calgary together um you know funny how that is but yeah you, i had a lot of things in my favor that uh i was able to survive number one it was a major sporting event uh so there's medical immediate medical professionals uh number probably number number one would be jim pizzatelli he was our medical trainer he ran on the ice he was a Vietnam uh, veteran who who had seen that injury before and knew exactly what to do to put pressure. And he's doing this in front of, you know, 18,000 people and a TV audience. And he kept calm. And the other the other thing probably was, you know, in the old Buffalo Auditorium, uh, both teams uh, came on the ice right behind the home team's net. And that's where it happened right there. So I was right. Had it been at the other end of the ice, I don't know if I would have made it all the way down the ice. Uh, to to get to our our locker room and doctors, so yeah, there was a long a, way to go. Yeah, so there no, were a lot exactly. a lot of good things happening for you that night, as bad as it was. Right, there were a lot, yeah. lot of things in your favor, and yeah. Um, so you know you go through that, and then you know like every good hockey player, like 
Well, we got to get back in there as soon as we can. And, and you certainly did that. When you look back at that, knowing what you know now, what would you have done? Well, that's a great question, uh, you know, Chris, because I think you and I are wired uh, very, very much the same. Most players are, but back in our day, uh, you were, you were a tough guy. I, I thought I was a tough guy. I tried to be, uh, but we were brought up, you know. Hey, and and our contracts back then. I mean, I was, I was, I, I, I was at the last year. That was the last year of my contract. And now all this doubt: Will he come back? Will he be the same goalie? All this stuff. But it, it, answering your question, I think, yes, I think I would have come back just as quick, but I would have probably liked to have some counseling, some some guidance, maybe. Maybe somebody would have said, well, the doctors were telling me not to come back. But, you know, that's just on the medical side. You you know, I don't have a lot of, I've lost a lot of blood. I'm probably weak. Um, but on the, on the mental side and the, the trauma side, yeah, it would have been nice to have a little uh, feedback from a professional saying, hey, you know, I understand where you're coming from. If you want to do it, go do it, but maybe you shouldn't, you know, we didn't have that. No counseling was offered. And I didn't think of it either back then. You know, we just did, you know, we, we fought for our contracts for our survival. Uh, my mental aspect, I had to prove that I could play again and be the same goalie. And uh, I had to prove it to myself too. Cause I didn't know, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know if I was going to be affected in a, in a way that, you know, I'd just be so fearful of, of playing that I couldn't stop a puck. <laughs> I didn't stop many anyways, but I, I couldn't <laughs> afford to, I couldn't afford to lose any more. <laughs> well, don't be so hard on yourself uh, right. because you're a good goaltender. There's no question. Uh, you don't get to the NHL uh, not being a, a great goaltender. You, you have to be, but um, you know, so that incident, you come back, uh, you get going again, um, and and you got kind of you're looking at, you know, you're, you're getting up there in age, and and you bounce back from that injury. And that night, and you talked about your mom and what your mom's going through. What was she going through, your mom? That the 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 fear of sitting there watching what happened to your son. And how long did she have to sit with that before you were able to reach out to her? Well, uh, you know, again, I was preparing for death and I asked our equipment manager, uh, I said, call my mom, tell her I love her because, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to die. And, um, you know, uh, I, my brother had happened to stop by her house. Uh, he, he was a cop and he, he was on duty and he just popped in to check on the game and it happened. And he said, oh, mom, it's just Clint. He broke his nose again, uh, you know, all that blood and everything. So thank God he was there to kind of, console her and then of, of course i uh i was in you know am i going to make it you know they got to do surgery they you know basically they got to save my life and then uh uh i think our i think our team uh pr guy or somebody called my mom and said hey he's 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 good he's gonna he'll, he'll he's he's gonna live so that probably happened uh you know all within three hours well well that's good she was able to uh, get some relief that way yeah um, you know, it's it's funny, Clint. I, I often say this. You know, we have this connection to the fans, right? That building fills up. You know, the game's about just before the game's going to start, they introduce everybody, and you come out on the ice. I remember me coming out on the ice, and everybody, yeah, they're clapping. You're at your home building, and they're clapping for you, and yeah. Uh, you make the big save. You score the goal, whatever. And, and everybody – but he's clapping for you and, and there for you. Um, but, and then they think they know you as a goalie. They thought they know me as a, but nobody really knows, you know, and I'm not going to say it's a finished product, but when we step on the ice in the NHL, people do not have a clue and rightly so of the journey and how difficult it was to get to that point. They just don't have a clue. And in your case, um, you had undiagnosed OCD. Mm -hmm. So that adds another whole level of, <laughs> you know, it's hard enough to navigate your way through life, you know, being fit and healthy and mentally sound, but then add the OCD on top of that, trying to play the position 
uh, of goaltender, which in and of itself is a, a, like insanity to do because I've done it. And I'll <laughs> tell you a little bit about that. But uh, how difficult that undiagnosed, when you look back at all that, what what were some of the things that OCD did it help you in ways when you were young and did it hurt you? What ways did it hurt you? Well, it hurt me uh, on the, on my lifestyle, my day to day. Like when I was a kid, I went through germ phases, you know, contamination issues. I went through all sorts of issues, but it, it really kind of helped me because I had a great work ethic, but this even gave it a, you know, maybe that was my work ethic OCD because I would do things repetitiously. I was obsessed with being the best goalie at my age group or even kids older than me. And then you, you get to the NHL or, or the minor pros and you just want to be the best. So you, you have that obsessive uh, train of thought where you, you just keep going and going and going. Uh, I'd be obsessive, not just about my training, but my off ice, my eating and back, you know, back when we played, you know, that nutrition stuff wasn't on the forefront, you know, <laughs> they, they, they came up with uh, saying chicken was uh, high protein. So in the juniors, we would stop and eat Kentucky fried chicken, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so, but, but yeah, I think it really helped me uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think I really got it pretty much under control when I was playing in the NHL. But then after the accident, I didn't know this, that trauma if you're predisposed to mental illness or, or any of these sort of things, it will, trauma will make that all explode. And, you know, after my accident, I came back in 10 days, I was this big hero in Buffalo. And, uh, you know, I rode that love and adrenaline. I was like this hero. And, uh, and I, it was the next season after that, all that had worn off that uh, adrenaline that I had. And that's when I really started to struggle. I mean, my OCD became unbearable. Like I could not leave the house. I had to force myself to leave the house. Now, uh, were you aware at the time that you had OCD? When was it diagnosed and did nope. you become aware of it? Not no, that. I, no, I, I, I'm, but I did have anxiety and I just attributed the anxiety to being a goalie or a pro athlete, you know? Got, yeah. Uh, but I, I had bouts of depression my whole life where I'd really sink low. Um, so anyways, it was the next season and I'm not, uh, I'm not doing good. I'm having flashbacks of the skate. I'm having panic attacks. I, I, I purposely did not sleep because if I slept, I'd, I'd wake up grabbing my neck, sweating, you know, reliving. And I'm, I'm not telling anybody this cause you, we didn't back then. No. And we had a Super Bowl party at, uh, at Pat LaFontaine's house. And I went there, uh, I probably stayed there 30 minutes had a beer and left because now I'm sleep deprived. I hadn't slept in 10 days because I sleep on a chair, a hard chair and just kind of nod off. And that was my sleep. And uh, so I, I went home and, and I, I had a fractured thumb I was playing with and I hadn't taken these painkillers. I, I read the label, do not drink with alcohol will make you drowsy. And I'm sleep, I'm sleep deprived and I'm not doing good. And the OCD, all these things, panic attacks and, so I, 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 I took a few, a few of those pills and then I drained a bottle of scotch thinking I'm going to sleep tonight. Well, that's when I, I woke up, my heart uh, stopped. And so I wake up in the hospital and I'm like, what the heck just happened? And there's a psychiatrist. They, might, they thought maybe it was a suicide attempt and, and it wasn't. Um, sleep deprivation and not thinking clear. And uh, so anyways, the, the psychiatrist there started asking me questions. And that's the first time I got diagnosed with mental illness, like the anxiety, panic attacks, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, you know, but PTSD was never, never brought up uh, back then. Yeah. So all of this uh, coming after the injury, um, uh, you, you end up leaving Buffalo, you went to you and Raj, San Diego, then you went to Vegas. And um, how are you dealing with one, you're in Vegas, you're not in the NHL anymore. And coming to grips with the end of okay, this is the kind of coming down the end of my because I remember my thoughts and feelings. Um, at the time, you know, I was near the end. I knew it was. I was starting to question myself, and it wasn't a whole lot of fun. Uh, when you went to Vegas, were you 
what what was that mood like when you were near the end? Well, first of all, um, when I got diagnosed, I'm still in Buffalo, I'm, and I'm struggling, and I'm seeing different doctors, therapists, different medications, and nothing was working. And my play got did, really so. Re- no one really picked up on it in Buffalo. The doctors did they diagnose you properly, or did they realize you were struggling well, with? Well, after I got diagnosed, yeah, and I'm yeah. seeing a psychiatry. Yeah, they're they're trying to help me now, but back then the medications weren't what they are now. And it was it, it was about two and a half years. And my play is not doing good, and I'm in and out of the lineup, and uh, you know, taking time off for mental. I can't function. So, anyways, I get sent to San Diego, and my first game there, I let in four goals on six shots, and I'm devastated. I can't even play in the minors. And Rick Dudley was our coach, and I went into Rick after the game and said, I'm retiring. I can't do it. And he didn't know exactly what was going on. He thought I was coming down more for conditioning. So I told Rick everything, and Rick is an outstanding human being, one of the best people. Right, in the he world. is. And Rick uh, got me into this specialist. And I'd seen all these specialists, but this guy was supposed to be the guy. And I, I don't have a lot of hope. But anyways, long story short, he got me nailed down with the right uh, uh, medication. And my life turned around. I, I remember uh, when it finally kicked in in six weeks, I was like, is this what it feels like to be normal? And so all of a sudden I'm playing again, I'm doing good. And um, I go to Vegas and, and I'm playing really well. In, in the IHL there. And ironically, Boston Bruins wanted to give me a shot because I was playing that good. And I didn't go, Chris, because yeah. I was in a safe place. I was in a happy state of mind. I was afraid to go back to the NHL pressures and maybe my mental health would, uh, you know, backslide again. So I stayed in Vegas. They gave me a, a new contract and that led into coaching and and all that but yeah I, I had a chance to go back to the nhl and and i know you're probably going well because well, <laughs> your question is kind of it's hard we're going through that end of the career f- phase and it's hard yeah and here i had a chance to go back to the show uh but after everything i'd been through i i just wanted to stay where i i felt comfortable um you know as close to my doctor you know it's all these all these things factored into it so obviously i, I well i shouldn't say obviously you're pretty happy with that decision now because you're still there, right? No, 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 and, no. I, I, where, where are you now? You're not I, in Nevada, is it? So I got into – yeah, I'm in Nevada. But Nevada, I got, I got, yeah. Yeah, I got into coaching with the Las Vegas Thunder. I, I finished playing, ended up being their head coach. Uh, things were going – There's. I don't want to go into too much detail because it's a whole different story, but I went to double-A to coach in Boise, Idaho. And I coached there. Then I got, uh, then I moved to Northern Nevada, Reno, Tahoe area. Yeah. But, but when I was, uh, after my d- days coaching in Idaho, I, I went to the NHL for years and years as a goalie coach. And, yep. uh, and, but I, you know, back then they were goalie consultants. So you'd only go in for a couple of weeks, home for a week, back for two. And then I ended up being a, a full-time goalie coach in Calgary. Okay. But I kept my, I kept my place here in in northern Nevada. Yeah, we're 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 seven miles or seven hour drive from from Vegas. Okay, so um, you you, you retire from hockey um, after being in, in in Vegas, and then you go into the coaching, and then um, obviously growing up in Grand Prairie, and I've been there, and <laughs> a cowboy you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, how's it go now when you step away from the game and how do we get to, um, <clears throat> and I hope you don't mind me asking this, but how do we get to the point where you just can't take it anymore and you've had enough of being on this earth? Well, that, that goes back to the PTSD. And I, I, like I'd said, I, I got on this medication. I was doing really good with the OCD, the depression, the anxiety, uh, PTSD still wasn't diagnosed. So I think the medications I, I was on were helping with my PTSD, but it, over about 15 years, I'm doing great. I'm coaching, but I'm moving around, you know, as coaches do. And I just think if I take this little pill, I, my mental, I'm going to, ha- I'll be, I'll be fine. And then Richard Zednick cut his jugular vein. But again, over time, over these years, my body was getting immune to the medication very gradually. Okay. 
And I, now I think the PTSD is starting to become the big factor. And I started to uh, self-medicate. I was drinking, you know, shoot. Uh, before, before I shot myself, I was drinking 25, maybe 30 beers a day. But oh. yeah, but that's American beer and I'm Canadian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so it's know, like 10 Canadian bits. Okay. Right. Yeah. But you, you, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get through a day and I'm having suicidal thoughts. I have no clue what's going on. Richard Zednick happened. So the media is all coming to me again and I'm reliving and it just, everything, everything that happened right then led me just uh, to go behind the barn with a gun and, and, and shoot myself and uh, <laughs> how I survived that one. I have no clue. I've got a, you know, I got a bullet lodged in my skull and I should be dead. You know, like I should be dead three times. Once from my jugular, once from the reaction to the painkillers in Buffalo. And then yeah. I got, and then I got a bullet in my head. So, you know, I guess the big, the big guy up there is not finished with me yet. Gus, the guy upstairs, <laughs> Gus, <laughs> Gus, uh, want you around for, and, and thank God you are still around. And, you know, um, Thank you. so you survived, survived that. How about now your significant other, Joni, is it? Yeah. 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 Joni. Yeah. Now, what is she dealing with? Oh, you know, here's the guy, you know, she certainly loves and cares about and, and you get to that point. How, how did it affect her? And then moving forward, how was she able to, reconcile with that and also be a be be a support supportive of you coming yeah back. She, she she went through hell with me i mean honest to god i think i think if it wasn't for her parents who were uh, her dad was, was an air force pilot and you know they they have a lifestyle that you know uh not a lifestyle but a motto you stick with your you know your family your military you take care you got each other sixes as they say you know yeah. And I think I think they were a big part of keeping her above water, so to speak. Um, yeah. You know, they kept saying, uh, you know, Clint's sick. You know, this is not Clint. We know Clint. And what he's acting like now, that's not the guy we know. He he needs help. And Joni was trying to get me help. But, it, you know, here it was hard. I mean, they were, you know, it was a two uh, or a year's wait to get into a shrink, um, you know, the we had a, we we had uh, one appointment and the doctor couldn't for whatever reason uh, they said well the doctor got called out here's a pamphlet you know have a nice day and meanwhile she's dealing with me who's drinking my face off uh, lashing out with anger I had a whole bunch of anger and who do you take oh, it out on you know I know what that's like yeah, yeah the, the 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 things I said to her if I'd have said it to you you'd have punched me in the nose you know just real mean hurtful stuff. Yeah. But but we say it to our loved ones because we think, oh, they're going to stay with us. And they, they know we don't really mean what we're saying, but yeah. the words still the words still are there. Yeah. And I know you probably understand a lot of that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so she, she hung in there. Um, you know, it was very traumatizing. When I shot myself, I did it right in front of her. Oh. You know, yeah, yeah. And I blamed her. I, I, I shoot myself. I don't even lose consciousness. And then I go, see what you made me do? You crazy b-i-t-c-h you know like yeah. anger anger that and i'm you know as, as rough and tumble as guys like you and i are and i know a lot of enforcers uh like yourself that the, the nicest people off the ice that you know most of the guys and you know this too and people say this all the time nicest teammate nicest guy you know yeah. and i think that's who we are so when this anger comes out boy it's an evil twin yeah, there's no question. And listen, I, I I can certainly empathize with you on that anger part because, you know, Jamie, uh, here, you know, I just got sober, turned my life around, but I I was kind of trying. I was trying to change, but I didn't know how. Right. I had to change some things. I didn't know how, and she really motivated me to. Uh, make those changes because she qu questioned me and she got to the point where she went back to Hawaii where she's from and she stayed there for about three months thinking, am I going to come back? And what she told me, she, she said she was that the anger had to stop. She said, I'm not going to, 
If you don't address it, I'm not staying around for it. And that really motivated me because I loved and care about her so much. I didn't want to lose her. And it motivated me to do the work. And I found out what I had to do and I did the work. And, and the beauty of that is, um, you know, a couple of years later, she affirmed that by telling me, you know what, I, I couldn't be more proud of you because you did the work and you've changed that part of your life, that yeah. anger part. And we yeah. don't realize it when we're in it. We don't know how to deal with those shitty emotions. Yeah. And um, we lash out because we're, we're in fear. We don't yeah. know. And, yeah. And thank God you have the support on that side, right? And Joni, and that that is <clears throat> that that's so cool. And again, behind yeah. every good man, right, is a, yeah. a strong woman. But, right. I I I I didn't know what happiness was until I got married, and then uh, it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know. So, oh God, the. But, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Were you well, going to say something? I, I, I did a support call with a guy uh, yesterday, and I'm encouraging. He doesn't know what to do, but he's got some mental health issues. He, he, he knows he's bipolar. He's been diagnosed, but he doesn't want to take medication and that. And I understand that. I, I do. You know, who wants to take a medication? You, yeah. know, um, you know, but people don't understand it's a chemical imbalance of the brain usually i know with me it is and and if it, what's what's diabetes it's a chemical imbalance just a different organ yeah. you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna tell a diabetic oh, don't take your medication push through it yeah well anyways uh my th this this gentleman said to me he says well you know what I, I i'll go see your doctor because he he doesn't like what the guys he's been seeing I, and i said i got a really good shriek and he knows his meds and i'm not saying he's gonna put you on meds but he'll he, he'll help you and his his reply was, you know, my wife will really like that because it'll show her that I'm trying to find the right way. So it kind of goes into what you're saying, you know, how Jamie, you yeah. know, you showed her that you're going to do the work and did the work. But yeah. how tough was that three months being apart? I bet you were going. Coo -coo. No, it was killing me. I, yeah. I was <clears throat> I was thinking, is she coming back? Um, you know, and and, and certainly. I could have went the other way, right? I could have yeah. went the other way and poor me, poor Chris, yeah, and and picked up a drink again or a drug, and then you know wallowed in my my self pity, yeah. Um, but I went the other route, and the old Chris certainly would have went that route, and uh, I'm so grateful today I didn't. Um, you know, so that incident we talk about, Joni. How about your kids? How did it affect your kids? Well, my kids were, were older and yeah. weren't really like, uh, they didn't see, my youngest saw me uh, drink a lot. You know, yeah. she, she, she saw that the, the, the bad parts of, of having a, an alcoholic father. Uh, I was not abusive to her or anything, but we do change. We're not the same dad. And, and we talked about that, you know, way later after, after I quit for a number of years. And uh, she kind of told me some things, you know, like, wow, you know, I didn't know what to expect, what you might say, you know, you weren't mean, but so she would have been the only one really affected. I mean, yeah, hey, when you try to kill yourself, they're obviously affected, but I mean, they were not in the immediate uh, uh, living area, you know, they were, yeah. they were, they were gone. So uh, they weren't really, really affected like, like Joni was. But yeah, that, I mean, um, you know, I, I do have uh, family members, so I don't want to get specifically that, that do struggle as well with uh, anxiety and, and, you know, addiction issues that we've addressed, thank God. Yeah. And, you know, it, you got to watch. I mean, I don't care. There's, there's a lot of gen genetic components to mental illness. You know, if you have, uh, put it this way, it runs in my family, you know. Yeah, and, and you really don't know that because not everybody's as public as as you and I are with our demons. So yeah. you find out later, well, oh, your your aunt or your uncle or your mom or dad, you know, uh, ha had issues or have issues. But uh, and and the same with uh, addiction. I think there's a I, I don't know if it's a gene, Chris. I don't yeah. know what it is, but. There's a good chance if it, 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 it's, it's in the family. You know, I had, my dad was an abusive alcoholic, great guy, 
but when he drank, he became a different guy, that evil twin, as I always say, and you and I both know about that, yeah. uh, you know, and, 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 you know, he never did get over it. I mean, he ended up dying of a massive heart attack, but he, you know, he drank and smoked his whole life. Well, you know, and you're right. You look at that, that alcoholism being the family disease, they call it. And, you know, the AMA uh, treats it as a disease. They do believe there's some genetics involved, right? Genetically can be predisposed to it. But when they say it's a family di disease, it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, you're going to get that gene. But it's a family disease because it affects everybody. Yes, the tentacles yes. of alcoholism uh, affect everybody in some way, negative ways. You know, there's kids I grew up with, you know, they grew up in households that there's a lot of drinking. I grew up in a household that there was a lot of drinking. Some people, they see that, they don't like that, they never drink. But they still get affected yeah. by the behavior and that, that whole thing you know, lifestyle. So, you know, that's the family disease piece, no question. But in, in, in my own family, uh, my, my children, they've seen me in, in, you know, and I, I look back and think about it, that the times I drank at home around the kids, the time when I come in, I was messed up on drugs and I could, I can only, I think back now, what the hell was I doing? One, two, how they looked at me yeah. and, and the only way to change that is obviously change this. And, yeah. and I'm so grateful I have, and I'm so grateful that my children um, have forgiven me for that part of my life. And well, um, I saw what my dad became when he drank the, the person he turned into. And I, yeah. I decided at a very young age, I am not going to be that guy. I'm not going to drink. I'm just not going to drink. Who needs it? I'm an athlete anyways. I, you know, but boy, uh, you know, I turned pro and then you're, you know, it's a different lifestyle. And I remember drinking my first times and I just loved the effect. I loved right. it. Oh, it was, where <laughs> my wife, she, she has a drink and she just wants to go to sleep, you know? So, <laughs> you know, and then I think when you got mental illness too, and you might be struggling with certain things and your mind is going a hundred miles an hour. Um, you know, you, you have a few beers or a few drinks and all of a sudden, ah, oh, life's not that bad. Why, you know, it turns the head off a little bit and you get some reprieve. And I think that's why there's a huge correlation between mental illness and alcohol or uh, addiction is because of the immediate effect, the immediate relief that it gives us. You know, yeah. you, you look at one hand, you know, feel crappy. The other hand's a beer bottle. Feel good. Well, I'm going to feel good. I can't, you know, I got to get off. I got to turn this hamster off uh, in my uh, head. Certainly the self, uh, self-diagnosis, self-medicating. Right? <laughs> right. We're all good. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's it. And, and like, you know, I certainly understand that from the, the, you know, the physical injuries I had and then getting on the, um, Percocet and then Oxycontin. It, I mean, it, it helped me until it didn't. It, and, oh, yeah. And, yeah. You know, it didn't anymore. And it just ate at my soul. And it was not a good place to be. Well, and, let me let um, me ask you this, Knuckles. Um, I know for, yeah. with, with beer, my, my go-to medication, you know, especially being a hockey player, uh, to get there, I'm anxious, okay, so have a couple of beers. Or I'm depressed, have a couple of mm. beers. Now I'm, now I'm happy or whatever it might be. My OCD is going. A few beers and it calms my head down. But the thing is, what, two and four – and then six beer, it took more and more beers to get this, the, the relief. Is that yeah. the same? Would that be the same as like? Yeah, oxygen? the progression. It's yeah. that, that's the progression, right? I had, um, you know, take two Percocet every four hours for the pain. Okay. Um, after doing that uh, for one day, uh, the next day, man, you need four yeah. <laughs> every two hours. And then it's that. Uh, progression of the disease and you you get to the point where you don't with the uh, opiates you don't even really it's not like you get relief in the form of oh it's going to kill my pain i'm going to get high yeah you don't get high you just get where you're normal again you yeah. know, well what you think is normal you're yeah. not sick 
Yeah. Because once the opiates, you're addicted to it and they get in your, in your bones, it gets in, it permeates every part of your body. And when you don't have that, the body craves it so much yeah. and it needs it to feel normal. So you end up taking those more yeah. pills the next day and then yeah. oof, you settle down. No more joint pain. Uh, right. No more diarrhea, no more throwing up, no more sweating, no more anxiety, no more. Uh, you just and you get caught up in the whirlwind of that. And you just I didn't have a clue how to get out of it. But it's it's similar in a lot of ways, um, you know, then alcoholism, drug addiction. It, it's oh, addiction. Yeah. Uh, period. Yeah. Um, a lot of similarities. Um, so. All right, you 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 get to that the point you you're gonna bounce back now uh, from after making that attempt on your life, um, the road back um, was it was it long and bumpy for you or? Um, well, first of all, I had to you, you know they put me in a coma because of the bullet in my head. They didn't want it to move, yeah. so I was in, I was in the hospital uh, for my physical you know, the bullet basically. Yeah. And then they sent me to a treatment center and I was, I was there six months in the first two months. I always think it was a waste of time, but now I, I, I understand it wasn't because I just had this denial. Was and, that in San Francisco? Yeah. 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 And I, 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 I was just so angry and in denial, you know, I just, and I, and it's funny how I'm walking around with a bullet in my head and I think I'm fine. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that again. You know, F off, leave me alone. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I got this, you know. And yeah, yeah. I drank too much. I'm, I'm not going to drink anymore. You know, leave me alone. You know, just like, and and I ha I guess now I, I, I look back, I had to go through that anger. And I'm really oh, happy. Yeah. Did, I'm so pleased with myself that I did not throw that other client out the window because I almost did because he was on yeah. my nerves. <laughs> and I had that anger. And I, I told him, I said, you shut up or I'm going to throw you out the window. I was dead serious. It was on the second floor, so he might have bounced and lived. I don't know, but <laughs> you, you, just that anger I had. And then once I got with the program, um, I got rid of that anger. And it, 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 it's so funny as addicts, it, it, the things we'll do. So when you when they admitted me, they got uh, you got to turn in your cell phone. So I had a team self. I had a team cell phone, and I had a personal cell phone. So I turned in my. Uh, Team one personal, I can't remember. I, but I yeah. saw a cell phone, eh? And yeah. so I, I understand. So that anger thing, I would call my wife, and you know, when I had a chance to sneak away and just lash out her, why I hate it here, why you got me here. And, all. and so I'm just directing all my anger at her. Well, finally I get busted. I think she I know she turned me and said, Hey, Clint's got a cell phone, and he calls me yelling and screaming. And so when Go I got her. busted. Yeah. Well, when I got busted, I was so mad at her and I, I, I packed my bags. I was leaving. I told the counselor, therapist, and, oh, God, there. Anyways, now I understand. <laughs> so, excuse me. <clears throat> they wanted me to direct my anger to the therapist, to the group yeah. uh, and all that. But as long as I had that cell phone, <laughs> I, I was venting at her like I had for, you yeah. know, before I got shot. So, yeah, and then I, I got through the anger and then I really got with the program. I guess the big word, uh, knuckles would be acceptance. I yep. finally accepted where I was at, what was going on. I do have major issues that I just can't say I'm fine and walk out that I needed help. And like you said, you didn't know how you, you, yep. you, 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 you wanted to get better, but you didn't know how. So that was my acceptance moment. And that's when I really was able to get to work and get well, get the tools, um, you know, and, and the tools I still use because, you know, this incident that's just happened, uh, you know, it's been a tough couple of days because I've been triggered. Yeah. And, you know, I've been waiting for a flashback, but I haven't had one, which is good. Uh, but I do have an extreme anxiety. Because of that, today not so bad. Yesterday not so bad. For Monday, Tuesday, Sunday, Monday, uh, Tuesday, I was I was pretty anxious, and uh -huh. you know, and, and you always think, you know, I, I'm I'm past that now. But you do think, man, I could sure use a beer. 
that that little that little uh <laughs> the little demon up there it'll yeah. still it'll still once in a while say well you know you could have a beer no i can't <laughs> no. There, you, there's, you... No, there's no a beer <laughs> yeah there's no such thing as a beer no. or a glass of wine no no, and, no. Uh, i think we know that um no. better than um a lot of normal people will say yeah. so clint with all that's going on this recent injury adam johnson what happened uh god bless him um the neck guard issue like it comes up we never thought in the nhl guys were gonna wear masks or okay yeah. you know a, a visor and now everybody's got them do you think this is something that should be mandatory uh nhl level or it, it, it won't be the players are it gonna won't fight be. it yeah and you know this chris is good yeah. We're, we're stubborn, we're superstitious, we're, uh, but what's going to happen, I, I believe, it'll be just like the helmets grandfathered in, and then the visors grandfathered in, the neck guards will be grandfathered in. What I can't believe is, is there's still some minor hockey associations like USA Hockey. It's not mandatory for the kids. It's you incredible, kids, right? You get these kids wearing them, and they, it's second nature. They don't even think about it, you know? Yeah. It, right. So that that's how that's going to roll. Uh, what what kind of baffles me like really the kevlar is it, it's a turtleneck and it's not even a full turtleneck it's a, like a bib with a turtleneck yeah. and, and it's a cloth it's not a hard plastic um you know i i and again i know the player side because i was there it it it's going to be oh it's uncomfortable it's restricted or whatever but they wear cut proof socks now. Ninety percent of the players wear cut cut through uh, right socks to protect their Achilles, right? <laughs> and I think it's fifty percent wear a cuff cut proof uh, wrist uh, protector underneath. Uh, it's a it's a cloth. Yeah. And, and here we're, we're we're going with our most vital uh, area on our body not not covered, but our Achilles is covered. Our wrist is yeah. covered. <laughs> what yeah. The heck? <laughs> They might want to cover that uh, jugular vein. Yeah, it, it's incredible when, when you know, we, we t really take a step back and look at it. When we look at the hockey player, they're like, you know, oh, yeah, everybody's worried about this now. That's what you can hear it in the locker room, right? Yeah. You can hear guys talking almost like, yeah, all right, it happened. It's a, It happens once every 15 years or something. So what are the chances? Yeah, but you, you know, you, there's a lot of guys uh, that I've heard of that have been cut, but it didn't cut their artery, but they've been cut yeah. across the neck. There was somebody I just uh, recently, uh, he's a pro and he's got a yeah. big scar, I guess, uh, but it didn't cut the artery, but he, yeah. he was cut. He was lucky. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, old goalie Corey Hirsch was here last week and we, a week ago, and we're okay. saying, man, when I watch hockey, I, I see so many close calls, like a scrum, a guy falls down, and around the net, the goalie, a guy's falling. But we both said, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often. We both said yeah. that a week, a week ago. So you, you get out, you move back to uh, Nevada. You have the the Malachuk Ranch. Mm -hmm. um, God, I mean, you are a cow. I love looking at your Instagram. <laughs> you, you out riding the horse and the plains and like, I'm just, or the foothills. I, I just love it. Like I always love riding horses when I got the opportunity. I haven't done a whole lot, but I love it. Yeah. Uh, how about therapy horses for therapy for you? Uh, I mean, so, it's gotta be, it's gotta be so soothing for you. No. Yeah. I, I actually live a pretty therapeutic uh, lifestyle. Because I have a place, I got horses, I got dogs, I got, you know, animals, I work on cattle. Um, you know, I, I live a cowboy life, really. And and people romanticize that lifestyle. But for me, it, it it's therapeutic because I love animals. I get to heal animals. I'm a horse dentist and horse chiropractor. Uh, I work with a veterinarian. We do tons of cattle work, you know, vaccinations, uh, uh, semen testing, bulls, all this, all this stuff. And... And and so I do have a pretty pretty cool lifestyle. I, I I'm very involved with uh, military veterans with PTSD. In fact, I got a tournament coming up in Vegas. I got to go coach, but I've done a lot of equine therapy with veterans. Um, I know how to do it. I know how to introduce them to the horses and and how healing it is for them. So yeah, I I, I you know I do I do a lot of 
you know, they call it life coaching and that. And, and I, yeah. I, I, you know what I am? I'm, I'm a support guy. I'm like you, you know, been yeah. there, done, been there, done that. I get it, pal. I understand the pain. I know it. I know it hurts. And, you, you know, that addiction and all that, that we self-medicate and everything. I, I've, I've been there. I've done that. You've been there. You've done that. So when somebody right. comes to people like us, uh, boy, they can drop their, their guard really, really eat a lot easier with guys like you and me because, and it helps too that we play in the NHL. I'm not going to lie. Right. Because they think, oh, yeah. wow, that, like these veterans that I go uh, with the hockey, they're disabled vets. And they just think it's the coolest thing that this old hockey NHL guy would care enough to come and hang out with them for four days, you know? And yeah. and it's the, it's the same when you're supporting people, you know, they think it's cool that, you know, we played in the NHL, but we, and, 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 you know, it's funny, you were talking about fans and, and all that. And, and now with the internet and people more public and everything, when we played like fans just thought we, you know, had no problems. We're, we, right. we did have the world by the tail. I mean, we're, we're living a dream, Oh yeah. but man, we're human too. And, yeah. and there's pressure and they think we just go to practice and play games. There's a lot more to it. <laughs> you know, you know, we yeah. worked our whole life to get there. Number one and sacrificed a whole bunch to get there and uh, by no means regret any of it, but we don't just show up and play hockey and you know, it's easy it, and, and we're human. We do have our, we do have our problems. Oh, we are human. There's no question about it. And I, I think of that, um, you know, uh, and we talk about resentment, right? Resentment's the number one offender to an alcoholic oh. or a drug addict, but I could certainly think of a few people I could send out there to test some of that semen for you, believe me. <laughs> but, uh, it, 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 people go semen test a bull. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You actually have to semen test a bull. Yeah. So, but it, it, just being around, like I'm a, I love, I have a St. Bernard. I, man, I love dogs. It's so for me, therapeutic. And, um, you know, I always hear about people with horses and, you know, working with horses and how good they are, equine therapy and all that. I, I just think it's so cool. And you're around that all the time. Um, you know, you grew up in Grand Prairie, you grew up around that, you get into the hockey, you go on and have your career in, in, in a great career uh, to make it. I, I always say this. I've had people on that only played a few games in the NHL. My partner, Tim, played 100 games in the NHL. He's like, oh, I am not really, not really made it. Yeah, baloney. <laughs> you play one game. I don't yeah. care. And I b believe me, I'm grateful for. I, I wish I played a thousand games. I had so many injuries at the end. I would have been close, if not for all those injuries. But that, that's my thing. And some people, oh, I only played this many games. And man, you make it one game. You make it the NHL. It's incredible when you. Well even if you and make it to, you know there's career american hockey league players or an echl player you know what yeah hats off to them man i mean that's not an easy lifestyle and and they're playing for the love of the game and they're just below the nhl they just need a break or whatever you know it's yeah it, yeah and we don't see it i follow this kid and recently there was an awesome fight they sent it out on Instagram and all the, the Twitter was all over the place. Alex Gallant, the Gallant brothers play in the minors. They're both from um, Summerside, I yeah. think, Prince Edward Island. And I, I met Alex this past year, and what a wonderful kid he is. But he's been in the minors. He's, he's like 31. He's been down there. He, every mm -hmm. season he goes back, he suits up, he shows up, he does. That's such a grind. And it's so, you know, for guys who've had that, lengthy career and you look at a guy who has that lengthy career in the american hockey league you're like oh, what's he doing why don't you get on with life but, but that's your dream you're playing it you're living your dream and when i think of it i remember when i went through the addiction and i had all the problems my i remember my dad in the last gladiators the film that my partner barry reese did um my dad said you know, he was bitter about hockey. He think he blamed it on hockey. You know, he said, sometimes I wish he never played in the NHL. I know how proud my dad was, you know, yeah. but he, he was looking at it like the NHL has caused this and it didn't, it didn't. Um, you, did you ever like feel that way? I wish I never played hockey or I wish, 
you know, nope. that never happened. Or no, nope. any regrets, any regrets? No, nope. no, nope. not none. But I do remember a time, you know, you, you know, there's a lot of pl uh, pressure playing in, in the NHL a lot. And, and especially when we played, we didn't have the security contracts they do now. So yeah. I, I just, I do remember there was times where I was like, man, I don't know if I can take this pressure. I just want to be a regular guy working nine to five. And then, you know, then I go, well, that's going to happen soon enough. You got to, you got to deal with the pressure, try to embrace it and enjoy the game because it's, it's a short career. We, we might not always think so when we're in it and playing, we th think we're going to do it forever, but uh, you know, then reality, you go, nah, this one of these days, and then the injuries start, you go, Oh boy, I can see the end. Um, you, you know, how, 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 it's harder, harder to play, harder to prepare when you're playing with a, you know, a busted up back or knees or hips or whatever it might be. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the evolution of an athlete. And I think it's there for a reason to give us that uh, sense that, you know, it, the end is coming. <laughs> yeah. And the end is never fun, but, um, you know, so you get the Malachuk ranch, um, you, you, you're working with vets. I saw you do some stuff on the ice with kids or goaltenders and stuff. How rewarding is that for you? And, you know, well, it, it, everybody thinks, uh, you know, what a great guy he gives. I do a lot of with the sled hockey too, the sledge hockey. And yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Every, everybody's, Oh, what a nice guy. What a great guy. Give it. I'm kind of a selfish prick, you know, I'm doing it for me too, buddy. <laughs> you know, yeah. it makes, well, it makes me feel good. It, it really makes me feel good. And, you know, I do a lot of public speaking and boy, that is so powerful when, when people come up to you or even contact you after, and they're definitely affected. Like I have people say, you know, I'm going to get help. I've been doing this all yeah. by myself, not telling anybody I'm going to get help. If you can do it, you know, thank you for doing it, whatever. And they hug you after a, a speech or something. It, it's, it's very, very rewarding. Is it ever? And I, I got to tell you, likewise, for myself, the number of people who have reached out to me through social media, through my website, who have said, Chris, I have saw this. I saw you speak. Yeah. You've helped me. You don't know what. And it does feel good. It, it feels great to help somebody else, especially because you know you've been there. You know what the pain is like. You know what the agony is like. You know what being trapped is. And you, you don't know where to go. And then you have someone like yourself who comes out and shares their story and someone sees it and they're like, you know what? That guy yeah, did well, it. I, I talk a lot about purpose and you, you, you probably can relate to this knuckles. Um, I thought my purpose was to be an NHL or, you know, to, you know, play in the NHL. That's all it's about yeah. hockey, hockey, hockey. And then you're there and you do it. And, 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 and but, I used to cuss God because when I was going through my mental health issues, I was like, God, I'd rather have a, you know, a broken back than because it, it, this is, why did you give me this? Why? No one can see it. No one can relate to it. And, and now I know my purpose. Yes. The NHL gives me a bit of a platform, but I used to cuss God. Why are you giving me these demons? And now I know why, because what I do today, I had to go through that. You had to go through your stuff. Otherwise, how, how do people come to us and relate? How do we help somebody unless we've been there? And okay. so that comes, you know, I, my, my purpose is to do what I do today, being a mental health advocate. And uh, I, I couldn't do that had I not gone through everything I went through. And, and yes, the purpose of the NHL just gives me a bit of a platform, but it's yeah. not my real purpose. Yeah, you definitely uh, have the degree in that. You have your diploma. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what? Uh, you don't have to cuss Gus anymore. Uh, right. You know, yeah. that's that's a good thing. Yeah, um, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so the ranch, life is good now. Um, if I can ask you this question, if you're to write, the first line of your eulogy, what would it be? I would say caring, caring for humanity, fellow man, caring for caring person for uh, those that are struggling in silence and in darkness. Uh, that's, awesome. that's, yeah, I, I, cause I do care and I do believe that God spared me 
for those that are still suffering. And that's why I, I care. And that's why I do what I do. I got a lot of compassion and empathy, 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 like you do for people that are going through what we've gone through. Yeah. We, you know what, that's... We, we could, we could just, we could just, but you know, part of the recovery is helping others. You know that, Yeah. Uh, you know, we could just not talk about it anymore. Good. I'm in a good place. I went through some bad stuff and screw everybody else. I'm yeah, good yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we don't, we, we, we try to help. And, and, you know, that is, that's awesome. And you do. And, and I tell you, I've had the opportunity, you know, you, we've met, we've looked each other in the eye and we've done a couple things together here. And I just really, I admire you, the person you are, sure your past, the hockey and all that, but I admire what you've done, what you've been through and how every time you fell off the horse, you're right back on it. And it, it's just awesome what you're doing today. And you're letting other people get a chance to get up in that saddle. And, and you know, when their their leg is caught in the stirrup and they're getting dragged around the countryside. Well, you're, you're getting good with the visuals, my friend. Right? I yeah, can say, well, yeah, <laughs> it's I, true. I, I, but I, I can actually, you know, honestly, uh, from the heart, say the same about you, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I appreciate it. Yep, yeah, it's what we do. Thank you as well. Now, so the book, The Crazy Game, uh, and I'll show everybody, if you didn't get a copy of this, get a copy of it, The Crazy Game, the uh, story of uh, Clint Malachuk, um, ultimate survival story. Um, I, can barely, I can barely read yet. I wrote a book. Figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we do that with help. I did. Yes, we do. Um, do you have a podcast? Is the, the Warriors Unmasked? You're yep. still doing the podcast, yep. right? Yeah. How's that going? It's going good. I'm, unfortunately, my my co-host, uh, I don't make it as much. He, like he's so good. He's like you. He's he he's got a good demeanor on the mic. He's a good host. And yep. uh, unfortunately, with my uh, with my lifestyle, uh, I don't get to be on as much as I'd like to. But yeah, yep. we're, we got some great guests, and yeah, we're still trying to save lives there too. It, uh, you know, we're, that's awesome. Yeah. We're focused on, you know, guests that have overcome. So cowboy up. Um, what do you know? You're about 63, 62. Two. Easy buddy. S 62. Okay. Back. Knuckle 65. Um, the cowboy thing. You're always going to, he's always going to be a cowboy, yeah. but like, the body. How's that feel on the body at this point in life? Like, you know, I'll really? be doing, does it, you know, does it grind on you? Oh yeah. I'm getting, yeah. uh, I think a lot of the old injuries are starting to really show more and more. Um, I think, you know, I, I do this every day, seven days a week, but if I do get a day where I actually get not to do anything physically, Boy, the next day, I really have a hard time. So I think doing it daily, I don't have a time to really, you know, I keep the you keep oiled up. That, oiled that's, up. that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Try to keep. But uh, and, and, you know, the elements, I don't handle the winters as good. And I got to work out in the cold, the heat in the yeah. summer. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'm not as I'm not as I, I'm not as resilient with the elements anymore. Yeah, I'm not either. I yeah. tell you, I, here I am. Jamie's from Hawaii. We could go live in Hawaii in a heartbeat. And here I am getting ready for another Canadian winter. Yeah. Yeah. Like in yeah. Montreal. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. It does I, wear I, on I, you. You might have had, uh, it, with that way of thinking, I'd say you've had too many concussions because I'd be in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Listen, um, I want to thank you for coming on. You know, last second, I, and I'm, you know, I always wanted to have you on. I just, and and you being nice enough to share your thoughts on what happened recently, I just um, well, you're, Chris, it's I would, impressive. I have, you're a good I, man. I, well, I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't you, uh, because well, I, because I I've done enough. That. Yeah, I've done enough. And when you called, I said, "Yeah, I'll do it for Knuckles." So well, that I really that's, appreciate it. Yeah, you know, that speaks uh, to our friendship. And I hope uh, we get to look each other in the eye again, and not on a oh, we will like. We and, will. And stick the hand up. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.